guys. I uh, got you back into the shop. This is part two. We did get some work done on the X231 block. I got all the rust cleaned off of it. Um, I cleaned all the gasket surfaces, chased a lot of threads, reconditioned as necessary. I got all the oil galley plugs taken out, thoroughly degreased the crane case. I flushed all the oil passages, got everything clean, got everything dry. I did put the oil galley plugs back in and I reinstalled the, uh, the pickup tube down in the sump tube. Other than that, this is still a, a bare engine block. So I'm going to take the next few minutes and talk about the differences between this pre-production 10X series block and the later production 10A445 block that I got hanging on the lift here. When you get into these things, um, you know, from five feet away, they look virtually identical, but you look at how they're constructed, you look at the differences in how the oiling systems are plumbed, there's really a lot of upgrades that were done in that 10A block over what this uh, pre-production 10X block had. So, um, guys, bear with me. I hope you can stick it out to the end of the video. I already know that this is going to be another one that's going to be longer than what I like to do. So instead of wasting any more time, uh, this has been enough of me talking. Let's just get into it. So, like I said in the first video, X231 is just a cross between an earlier model ZB tractor and a later model 445. And when you look at the engine block, it becomes quite apparent that they started with a ZB block casting mold and just modified a few key areas to suit their needs on this project. A couple areas I want to talk about on the 10X block here, you can see it's got a flat uh, top portion of the bell housing, completely enclosed on the side. And at one time, this flange ran all the way around the outside, but they ground a pretty good section away here to provide clearance for the steering shaft that comes down through this area. And we will compare that to the 10A production block from the 445. That steering shaft relief became a cast-in feature. They added a couple threaded attachment points on the top of the bell housing and this flip-up cover with a hole behind it to access the timing marks on the flywheel. So another ZB feature found on this block is what's left of the old raised mounting boss for the earlier style external mount governor. Obviously never utilized on X231. Instead, they went with the front crankshaft mounted centrifugal ball unit that was used on the later 445s. And looking on the inside of the block, nothing's even been milled out in the area where that earlier side mount governor would have extended into the crankcase. Okay guys, for this part of the video, I just loosely installed X231's cam back in the block. I know it looks a little rusty yet, I haven't cleaned it up and it's not ready to go back in, so just bear with me, but it is a ZB style four bearing camshaft. It still has the shouldered portion in the middle where that side-mounted governor drive gear would have once been. Obviously never utilized on X231. So we'll compare that with the production 10A block from the 445. You can see they just have a three-bearing camshaft set up since they did away with that side-mount governor. They had no need for a centrally located gear on the cam anymore. So the two center bearings were just replaced with a single wide one. So main difference between X231 and 445, three-bearing cam. Next I want to talk about the oiling systems and the differences between the two setups in these two engine blocks. We'll start with X231 here. Uh, as we already discussed, it has the ZB style cam and these cam bearings do rely on splash lubrication for their oil supply. The main bearings are pressure fed with oil. These pressure feed lines come off of the main oil gallery that's in the bottom of the block and they do supply oil to the front main, the center main and to the rear main bearing via this tube right back here. Back to the front of the engine again. You can see this front feed tube only supplies oil to the front main bearing. It looks like they may have had a secondary tube coming off of this at one time, but they decided to do away with it, and they just capped that off with some solder. The center main bearing does still have a secondary feed tube coming off of the main. It comes up here, attaches to this fitting. That fitting leads to an oil passage that comes up to this portion of the block, it allows oil to be pumped up this standpipe where it is then fed to the rocker arms and all the upper valve train components. It also allows oil to come into this fitting here and it runs through this external line to another fitting at the front. That fitting just feeds an open port right here that allows lubrication to get into the area where your distributor and oil pump drive shaft is. So now we'll compare that to the 10A production block from the 445. Still a very similar oiling system. The front main bearing and center main bearing are still pressure fed with lubrication via these oil feed tubes. They are constructed a bit differently from what's in X231 and they attach a little differently, but their overall function is the same. 
The rear main bearing is also fed via its own oil tube as well. Um, a main difference here on the 445 production block uh, in contrast to the, uh, the 10X block over there is that they also made the front two cam bearings pressure fed with oil as well. The rear cam bearing is still a splash lubricated area, but in actually providing a positive flow of oil to the front two cam bearings, they were really able to simplify and streamline how lubrication was carried to the other parts of the engine. So to really illustrate how exactly how they streamlined the rest of the oil delivery system, we'll just take a look at how this one was plumbed. Of course, you have oil coming through the main feed line that's lubricating the center main bearing. So this stub tube that comes off, instead of coming up here to where that fitting was on the 10X block, it comes out and it puts oil under pressure directly into this center cam bearing journal area. So oil under pressure inside the journal finds its way into another passage that's drilled down into the upper portion of the bore here. Oil then feeds that passage again to this area of the block where it finds a similar standpipe. The oil is carried up and it lubricates all the upper valve train. You'll notice on the 10A block here, they have this side port plugged off. This is where that angle fitting came out to externally carry oil supply to the front of the engine on the 10X block. To explain why we no longer need this port, we'll just go ahead and take a look at the front cam bearing real quick. So front cam bearing journal, supplied with oil just like the center one is. Um, again, an oil passage is drilled down into, into the upper portion of this bore. That passage extends up this portion of the block and feeds out right here, which gives your distributor and oil pump drive shaft its supply of oil. Um, really just a streamlined system. It gets rid of all this external piping, um, fewer overall components needed for the engine, and fewer potential leak sources on the outside of the block itself. Main bearing cap bolt comparison. X231's main bearing cap bolt, 7 16 by 14. Production 445 main bearing cap bolt, 1 half by 13. Um, quite a difference in strength there overall. Another rather interesting piece that came out of X231's engine block is this. Um, it's just a little piece of tin. Doesn't look like much. It's got some old prairie gold paint on the one side and they roughly bent it into a 90 degree shape. Um, for some reason, it was attached up in this upper corner of the engine block just to kind of act as a baffle to partially close off this open area up here. So here it is in position where I, I originally found it. Um, really, I don't know what the purpose of it is. It just kind of walls off that upper open area somewhat. Um, looks pretty insignificant now. But then when I went and checked out the production 10A445 block, I did see something kind of interesting. Okay guys, here's the 10A production 445 block. We're in the same upper corner area of the crankcase and you can see they pretty much uh, made that little modification permanent. They have a uh, wall here that's a part of the engine block casting. It's got the same open void back in there behind. Uh, really can't tell you what the purpose of that is, but they obviously decided to make it permanent. Well, if you've made it this far into the video, you've probably noticed that X231's engine block has these rather rough looking bars that were kind of crudely welded into the bottom of the crankcase. Really, those are just some reinforcement bars that are a part of the uh, the attachment points that it looks like they decided to add after the block was cast. Um, these became standard on 445s and many of the models after for uh, implements, uh, different attachments, what have you. They have a couple threaded holes and you can see this one looks like it was a built up raised boss where they just pretty much kept putting weld on the surface of the cast block and then ground it flat. Looks like they might have even had a little bit of a crack that started. I'm pretty sure this uh, thin area of the block didn't like all that heat that was gen generated from adding all that weld, but it seems to be pretty good now. It's all intact. Um, kind of an interesting little feature there. Definitely, uh, definitely was added after the block was made, though. Just looking at the other side of the block here, same two attaching points just on the other side. Definitely a lot of material has been added, and it looks like they might have had quite a hole here that they had to fix. Uh, one interesting note about these uh, areas over here, these welds are quite porous. Even after I cleaned the rust off the engine block, every couple days I'd come out here and there'd be a fresh film of oil on things that I'd have to wipe off with a rag. So 
this is going to be a leaker. Uh, that's just how it is. That's kind of what makes the prototype part of this thing, and that's also what makes it cool. So I'm really not going to do anything with it. I'm just going to get it clean enough to get paint to stick and just have to keep uh, keeping it clean after that. This actually just occurred to me. Um, the reason this bar is straight and this bar bends out the way it does is to provide clearance for the number one crankshaft throw, basically so that when uh, number one rod is on its downstroke, the cap doesn't come around and contact this bar. Don't know why I didn't think of that until now, but it's something that just struck me looking at this thing. But uh, as always, we'll just compare it real quick to the 445 production 10A block. You can see that raised mounting boss became a cast-in feature of the block. And we're uh, well gusseted. There's some nice webbing around there. There's ample material around where the threaded bores are. So just another uh, kind of an engineering history lesson here on some of the things they did. Okay, finally, the last thing I want to talk about with X231's engine block here is the three bolt mount flange starter setup that's on this one. I kind of referenced that in the first video. Really uh, kind of an unusual thing for the Minneapolis Malines of this size and this vintage. Um, of course, the 445s all end up, ended up using the single set screw style retention bolt with the lock nut that both aligned and retained the starter into the bell housing. But down here we do have the original starter from X231, uh, the three bolt flange, like I say, it is a Delco Remy starter. One interesting part of it though, and I'm gonna try and get the camera to focus small enough here, on the tag, it does have way down here at the bottom, engineering sample written with a tag that has a green background. Um, we're going to do our best to get that old paint removed without damaging that tag. Uh, just kind of another interesting piece, uh, interesting part of the history of this tractor. Uh, that's really about all I got for now. Um, guys, if you've stuck it out to this point and you're still with me, I thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you for watching. I wasn't trying to bore you there, but there was really no better time than now to really have a good look in, inside this engine, take a good look at everything that's going on, compare and contrast differences between the pre-production version versus the finished product, uh, stuff like that. So um, stay tuned for part three. It's going to be uploaded here shortly. we got a lot of things going on. We've ordered a lot of new parts. Some of those have already started to show up, and we are uh, just about ready to get some, uh, some of X231's engine parts sent out to the machine shop. So... Things are finally starting to happen. So guys, as always, again, thanks for watching and I hope to see you back next time.